For the Ancient Near Eastern Art Department today, it is a great pleasure to have the participation of one of our valued staff members uh, in this event, Associate Curator Kim Benzel, who is really the perfect choice for today's theme. Kim has been a treasured colleague and friend of mine since 1990 when she first came to the museum and we have shared the challenges and the joys of working together on many exhibitions uh, in the 90s, most memorably, the Royal City of Susa, Assyrian Origins and Art and Empire, and also more recently, uh, Beyond Babylon and Afghanistan Hidden Treasures from the National Museum in Kabul. And now Kim is also deeply involved in our next major project, uh, the exhibition opening in September 2014 with the uh, preliminary title From Assyria to Iberia, Crossing Continents at the Dawn of the Classical Age. And one aspect of that exhibition will be the focus of next year's Wilkinson Lectures. In addition to um, several articles on the jewelry arts of the ancient Near East, Kim has written and produced with um, Yelena Rakic and Sarah Graf in our department, a really wonderful and much needed te uh, teacher's resource on the ancient Near East, which I would recommend for anyone wishing to gain an overview of the ancient Near East and of our department. She has also participated in several archeological excavations, primarily at sites in Syria, at Tilbarsip and Umm el Mara and regularly teaches the ancient Near East sections of the Barnard College Introduction to Art History Survey, as well as the ancient Near East portion of curatorial studies uh, offered by the Institute of Fine Arts of NYU. Of special relevance for today's talk is the doctoral dissertation that Kim has recently completed at Columbia University with the uh, title Puabi's Adornment for the Afterlife. Her Art historical research, with its emphasis on the material and technological agency of ancient Near Eastern um, jewelry, has been informed by her study of goldsmithing at Kulik Stark Academy in New York, where she specialized in techniques and methods used in antiquity. And the result is a unique approach that promises a deeper understanding of the outstanding jewelry in the royal tombs at Ur and in uh, the tombs of the royal Assyrian women at Nimrud. So please join me in welcoming Kim Benzel, uh, who will speak to us about adornment for the afterlife, jewelry and identity at Ur and Nimrud. Good afternoon. Thank you, Joan, for that very nice introduction and also for inviting me to speak today. I'm really, really happy to be here. It's home, but I'm still happy to be here. <laughs> um, no glasses. Let's start. When scholars investigate the issue of identity in antiquity, to plan for and achieve from a single piece of gold the wire pin at the one end and the wide splay into seven prongs at the other, the goldsmith must have possessed an intimate knowledge of the mechanics and movements of gold as it was hammered repeatedly. While the comb appears simply made in the sense that its body has no decoration or ornamentation, the process of hammering such a large piece of gold requires tremendous feel for the metal as well as time and patience. All metals harden and become brittle as they are worked, especially by hammering. They require constant heating and reheating to gain their malleability for further hammering or for other kinds of manipulation. We call this annealing in modern technical terminology. If they are not annealed properly and often enough, metals simply stop responding or become so brittle that they show cracks and fissures. They can even split or break into pieces. In fact, hints of such stress marks are observable at five of the six points where the body of the comb divides off into the seven prongs. Gold in its native state, that is gold between 70% and 90% pure, is thought of as extremely malleable and ductile. Indeed, in, a ma in 
smaller amounts, this is true. It is certainly more malleable than gold that is further alloyed with silver, copper, or other materials, or than baser metals. However, many of the gold ornaments found with Puabi, all of which likely fall within the purity range of native gold, <clears throat> were made from rather substantial single pieces of metal, which entailed enough hammering to sh shape their respective forms that the metal would have become quite work-hardened in the course of manufacture and therefore required considerable annealing along the way. Even smaller ornaments included extensions, such as the suspension loops seen here and which I will discuss shortly, that no longer qualified them as small enough in amount to be easily worked without constant annealing. In the case of the comb, I imagine that the goldsmith would have begun hammering at one of the short ends of the elongated solid gold mass, first to secure enough length for the wire pin at the one end, then to continue with the large flat surface that makes up the body. He or she would have needed to anneal the metal scores of times for this much gold to remain malleable enough to be hammered successfully into the sizable body of its completed form. The process of annealing each time is not, is not a particularly speedy one, in addition to being highly repetitive. The metal must be heated evenly and carefully so as to achieve maximum compliance, but not to melt or blister it. The constant annealing required in order to proceed with hammering is deceptively labor intensive and takes great skill and sensitivity. Unlike intricate decorative techniques such as granulation or filigree, which immediately present themselves to the viewer as difficult and time consuming, the hammering of metals does not advertise the labor and expertise involved. The technique and the process are largely hidden and silent within the final pro product. This lack of technical ostentation in itself challenges the common interpretation that this jewelry was created primarily as a marker of royal prestige and wealth. This claim will become of primary importance when the Ur jewelry is compared to the jewels from Nimrud. What is also hidden within a final product made in this manner is the fact that if, at the end of the hammering process, the mass of gold had not been sufficient for the desired design, then the goldsmith would have had to begin from scratch or resort to soldering or brazing additional sections to the main body. This is an important technical point when evaluating the procedural decision not to use any means of solder or base or alloy and the consequent implied skill of the goldsmith. Thus, while one's first impression of the comb is that, although quite large and lovely, it is rather simply made from undecorated sheet gold, it becomes clear that even from even this abbreviated analysis that its manufacture was anything but simple. Now let's look at the botanical wreaths that adorn Poabi's head. Again, the predominant technique employed to make the gold elements of the wreaths is hammering. The goldsmith fashioned each of the many leaves from a single unit of gold, hammering in one direction to make the leaf shape and in the other direction to form the suspension loops for stringing. And I don't know if you can see, these are close-ups of, of each of these. And you can see how the leaf shape goes right into these suspension loops. And in a second, I'll show you a uh, detail of those loops themselves. Much like the comb was hammered in one direction to form the pin and, and in the other to make the body with splayed prongs. In the case of the wreaths, wreath pendants, the shaping of each leaf was a fairly simple procedure since individually they did not involve the large, the large amount of gold surface, golden surface area that the body of the comb did. Nonetheless, frequent, annealings, frequent annealing was required both for the hammering of the shape and for the chasing that was done to delineate the veins. By examining the suspension loops that belong to each leaf and leaf element and that were formed from the same piece of gold as the leaf, the procedural aspect becomes more significant. As with the allotting of gold for the comb, the hammering of the gold leaves entailed planning not just for the leaf design, but also for the narrow strip of gold that continued beyond the fine stems and served as the suspension loop for each leaf once it had been folded into the desired shape, as we just saw. While the three separate wreaths have three separate de design variations of this loop, they share a fundamental aspect of technique, the use of a single continuous and seamless piece of metal whenever possible. In the case of the two poplar leaf wreaths, and I show only one of them here, 
one can see that the strip of gold extending from the leaf stem was folded and rolled, almost ribbon-like, into tubes intended for strands of beads. So you can see that from any given leaf, the stem went right into, from a single piece of gold, into the suspension loop. And if this is microphotography, you pick up that stem here, and they don't break it. It goes So it's really obsessive. <laughs> Um, the amount of annealing and therefore time needed to hammer and fold each of the many loops was again considerable. Likewise, a significant amount of feel and skill were once more required to calculate and execute the movement of a single unit of gold into both the leaf shape and the suspension loop. An easier and more practical way would have been to produce multiple tubes that could be laid side by side, soldered together, and subsequently attached to the leaf to form the loop. In this system, if something went wrong in the making of the ornament, one could replace one part rather than starting from scratch to create an entire new leaf and loop out of a single piece of gold. The sum of making the part separately would have required less work than the making of each leaf and loop as a coherent whole. It seems that this alternate approach would have been especially relevant since there were so many of these leaves made for Puabi and for others in the cemetery. These are varying sets, some of the many, many, many hundreds of sets that um, were excavated at Ur. One could quite efficiently have made each type of part in an almost production line manner and then assemble them into complete ornaments. Yet, the goldsmiths chose the more difficult and time-consuming method. Was this to avoid breaking the gold into various bits and thus needing to join parts, thereby compromising the seamlessness of the pieces, both physically and conceptually? Was the goldsmith circumventing the use of solder, which would have added impurities to the gold and compromised the physical and conceptual purity? Was there a particular method prescribed for ritual reasons? What does that mean? <laughs> I have no control of that. <laughs> um, okay. uh, was there a particular method prescribed for ritual reasons? These are all questions that immediately come to mind once the technology has been closely examined. I will show one last example, that of Puabi's hair ribbon, perhaps the least outwardly impressive of all Puabi's jewelry, yet one that constitutes a hammering tour de force. The ribbon of gold is remarkably plain and devoid of any decoration or iconography whatsoever, and therefore would normally never be singled out as a noteworthy object in any art historical discussion. Yet it represents the epitome of technical expertise due to the enormous amounts of skill, feel, and time, and constant annealing required for its making. Hammering sheet gold into a long, straight strip such as this is exceedingly difficult to do with accuracy and without having it break at some point along the way through work hardening and splitting potential of the metal. Again, as with previous, exa previous examples, the goldsmith would have had to begin from scratch if the metal was to have split, <clears throat> cracked, or broken. Even in their completely undecorated state, such ribbons, and there are scores of them in the orb, Burials, you can see them here, here, and here. Best, exem best exemplify the virtuosity involved in the craft of hammering at Ur. From this brief examination of Puabi's jewelry, several technical aspects must be reiterated and stressed because they have as much conceptual as technological significance. First, the goldsmith must have been an expert at his or her craft. As we have seen, the amount of hammering into a shape such as the comb, although not a complicated technique, required considerable knowledge of the mechanics of the metal and a feel for knowing where to begin and how to hammer the gold so that the overall design of this rather large ornament could be achieved in a seamless manner. Hammering also entailed a substantial amount of time because of the need to constantly and carefully anneal the metal. The primary components of hammering are thus feel and time, technical elements that are not evident in the final result, but requiring as much, if not more, expertise as fanciful decorative techniques. In other words, the expertise involved in hammering is largely hidden, but far from insignificant. 
Furthermore, it is crucial to note that the hammering of flat sheet is the primary metalworking technique among the ornaments produced for Puabi. Of particular interest to me is the design decision to favor flat sheet over ornamental details, which produce surfaces that actively enhance the sheen of the gold being used and exploited the resulting reflection of light or shine. On a more theoretical level, this approach created in technique the semantic equivalent to the Sumerian word for shine that formed part of the Sumerian term for gold because shine was deemed inherent to the metal. Furthermore, the Sumerian sign indicating shine could also signify holy or sacred, so the two concepts were often conflated. Thus, I would argue that in the case of Puabi's jewelry, the technology itself exhibits agency, and that shine and conceivably some aspect of the sacred were being deliberately produced or performed in its very making. If indeed purposeful, and I believe strongly that the technique of hammering so much flat metal sheet was very consciously chosen or prescribed, this reinforcing of material and semantic properties in the associated technical processes represents a subtle yet sophisticated use of repetition or doubling, a conceptual operation that is well known in the visual and literary imagery of Mesopotamia and seen here in technological form. Repetition on a more mechanical level is essentially a byproduct of hammering and constitutes a second aspect of manufacture at Ur that is also obscure but fundamental, once again both in its technical importance and conceptual significance. The very act of annealing, the foremost component of continuous hammering, is repetition writ large and accounts in part for the tremendous amount of time expended to make Puabi's jewels yet it is not overtly appreciable in the final product. It is interesting to note that on a conceptual level, the act of repetition is also a key factor in ritual procedure, so that the technological process of repetitive hammering conceivably supported a ritual purpose to the jewelry. Seamlessness was mentioned earlier and comprises a third and crucial aspect of the jewelry technology at Ur for several reasons again, both physical and conceptual. For one, it entailed the use of a single piece of gold whenever possible, rather than multiple ones joined together. This technique preserved the integrity and relative purity of the gold, as well as the visual unity of the piece. The use of separate elements would have interrupted both the material and the form, and the use of solder quite literally would have added impurities to the metal by way of the baser elements contained in it. For instance, by hammering the prongs out of the same piece of metal as the body of the comb and the suspension loops directly out of the same metal as comprise the leaves, rather than soldering or joining by any other means, the goldsmith opted for the more difficult but pure and more holistic method. Easier means were available during this period, so one must assume the choice was not by default but deliberate. This approach has implications concerning not only the compositional or economic value of the gold, but also the potential ritual value or symbolism of the finished product. Once again, the, pr the procedure chosen achieved in technical terms the semantic equivalent to the Sumerian word for pure that formed part of the Sumerian term for gold because, like shine, it was deemed inherent to the material. In fact, and perhaps not surprisingly, the Sumerian sign indicating pure is the same one used for shine, which you may recall is also the one used to signify holy or sacred, suggesting that all three concepts could be conflated in certain contexts. Thus, one might again argue that the technique itself had agency, that purity as well as shine and sacredness were being performed in the very process of making. This consideration, in conjunction with the others mentioned, points to the possibility that Puabi's jewelry carried a cultic charge, which in turn could be transferred to her, its wearer's, identity. The entire progression of which was seemingly activated first and foremost by the materials and methods of manufacture. Finally, seamlessness quite literally hides the hand of the mortal maker, thereby leaving open the question of who made the object and how, and giving the impression that the object simply exists rather than being made at all. 
A similar operation is well known from ancient Near Eastern texts that describe the making of cult statues, where the process entailed rituals that purposefully obscured the role of the sculptor, allowing a statue to miraculously emerge in its fully finished and animated state as if made by the gods. I believe that a related conceptual maneuver was likely being carried out in the technical processes chosen for the making of Puabi's jewelry. These are all hidden aspects of technology that are rarely explored because they are for the most part poorly understood or even completely unnoticed. The finished product generally provides the starting point for all art historical investigations, leaving process and procedure to the fields of studio art and conservation. My aim today is to show that the procedural or technological aspects of the creative endeavor provide additional ways in which to read the jewelry. Considered in this light, the jewelry produced for Puabi easily fits the descriptions given in Sumerian texts of expertly fashioned, skillfully made, or brought to a perfect end, and does so quite literally and physically based on the technical procedures actually used, not just on interpretations of textual references to the production of objects. As pointed out by Irene Winter, the Sumerian terminology for crafting reflects a great sense of value attached to the objects they describe, a value that stems as much from the skilled craftsmanship exhibited in the finished objects as from the operative values of the raw materials out of which they are made, or the distinguished function they may have served. I would add that also emphasized in the wording, especially in phrases such as brought to a perfect end, was an implied mandate for a particular prescribed procedure attached to the making of valued objects objects that resulted in a seamlessness, a hidden perfection that could not but be perceived to stem from a magical or sacred source, or even in some measure activate the magical or sacred because it effectively erased the hand of the mortal maker. To be stressed here is the sense that at Ur there clearly existed a correct way of making certain objects, indeed a procedure that was prescribed by a source other than the artist's own inspiration and creativity. Extending this logic a bit further, I propose that the technological processes employed for Puabi's jewelry, most especially the golden ornaments worn on her head, affected specific results in the final products via techniques that were consistently repetitive, prescriptive, and aimed at maximizing the seamlessness of design and manufacture, in addition to reinforcing the properties of shine and purity inherent to the gold itself. In short, the making of Puabi's jewelry entailed procedural ingredients essential to ritual and cultic production, repetition, prescription, and seamlessness, all consistently applied at great additional expense of labor. In the process, some aspect of shine, purity, and possibly the sacred was being constructed in both the dead body and the live image of Puabi, and thereby in her person and identity the materials and making of her jewelry were active agents in that process. And now we'll turn to Nimrud. Another of the great archeological finds of the 20th century was that of spectacular royal tombs discovered in 1989 by an Iraqi expedition at the site of Nimrud in northern Mesopotamia. The tombs were located in a palace belonging to the 9th century BC Neo-Assyrian king Ashurnasirpal II and the palace is here. This is the mound of Nimrod, and the palace must be up there. Again, I can't see in that oblique angle. The same Ashur Nasrpal, whose magnificent relief sculptures one can visit in our galleries upstairs. The Nimrod excavations, like those at Ur, yielded an astonishing amount of dazzling jewelry made of gold and precious stones, as well as lug other luxury goods of similarly costly materials. However, unlike the situation with the burials at Ur, at Nimrud there was clear inscribed evidence that at least two of the tombs belonged to the consorts or wives of powerful and well-known Neo-Assyrian kings, making unequivocal the identification of the interred bodies as royal. And you have a few examples. You probably can't see well, but there, the bowls are inscribed on their rims. That's a tablet and the sarcophagus lid. I sort of explained that up there. Additionally, although little other actual jewelry of the same date has been excavated, the Neo-Assyrian period provides us with images of royal jewelry in other media, such as ivory and stone relief sculpture. 
While it may appear then that there is no need for further discussion on the topic of what constitutes royal jewelry in the 9th and 8th centuries BC, apart from showing what these jewels look like, I will nonetheless give an overview, if briefly and more superficially than was done for Puabi's jewelry, of some of the techniques used to create these extraordinary pieces. As you will see, the conclusively royal nature of the Limrud jewelry combined with the technologically varied and ostentatious manner in which it was made will provide a stark contrast to Puabi's jewelry and the methods of manufacture favored for its making. The difference in technological choices encompassed by the two corpuses will be apparent and I believe persuasive in terms of the active role technology can play in the construction of identity, even in death. The Nimrud jewelry has only rarely been seen in public since its discovery in 1989 due to the constant state of unrest in Iraq since then, making exhibitions of treasures such as these nearly impossible for security reasons. Here you see the jewelry at the Iraq Museum in Baghdad on display for a mere three hours in July of uh, 2003, the primary purpose of which was to confirm its survival of the looting of the museum in April of that same year. If we begin our tour of some of the individual pieces, focusing on those from tombs two and three, the tombs known to belong to possibly four, but more likely three royal women, what one notices most immediately is the staggering amount of jewelry, especially of gold jewelry. Based only on the small selection I have shown you thus far, one can easily calculate that there is far more jewelry buried with these women than any one of them, or even all of them together, could have worn at a single time, moment in time. For example, there are literally scores of earrings, necklaces, and appliques that would have been sewn onto garments. The sheer quantity constitutes the first important contrast to the burial jewelry of Puabi, the entirety of which was found on or near her person and seems to have been conceived as a single ensemble to be used together. The second aspect of the Nimrud jewelry that differs quite notably from Puabi's is the range of styles represented by the various pieces. The jewels, like so much of the material culture associated with the Assyrian court, reflect a penchant for accumulating a mix of Assyrian, North Syrian, Cypriot, and Egyptian luxury goods, as well as favoring Phoenician works that often fused any or all of these many different cultural elements within a single object. Since my focus in this paper concerns technical style over artistic style, I will say little more on this particular topic, but refer you instead to the special exhibition that our department is presenting in the fall of next year titled Assyria to Iberia Crossing Continents at the Dawn of the Classical Age, which will address in detail exactly such distinctions and interactions of cultures and styles in the ancient Near Eastern and Mediterranean worlds of the 9th to 7th centuries BC. Here I, here I have drawn attention to the amount and variety of jewelry in the Nimrud tombs solely to suggest that the ornaments must have been collected throughout the lifetimes of these royal women and were likely worn by them at different times in life before being buried with their owners, in contrast to Puabi's adornment, which I have argued was conceived of and made for a single purpose and occasion, that of her burial. And now I will turn to the technical aspects of the Nimrud jewelry, which I believe further and perhaps best support a marked contrast with the burial jewelry of Puabi. As you can see, it would be impossible to show and discuss every ornament found in these tombs. However, even a cursory look at some of the more prominent pieces should sufficiently illustrate my point. Let's begin with one of the most iconic of the Nimrud treasures, the crown found in tomb three, among other notable pieces. The viewer is immediately confronted with an exceptionally complicated design that incorporates many different iconographic details. Looking more closely and specifically at the technical aspects, it is also apparent that the crown was constructed of scores of individual elements, many of which were, many of which were embellished with any number of ornate and highly visible decorative techniques such as granulation, filigree, repoussé, chasing, cutting, piercing, piercing, cloisonné, and other inlay work. 
Hammering was, of course, also involved, but primarily as a means of creating the many, many small surfaces of gold that would be further enhanced using one or more of the methods just mentioned. A rather complex and elaborate substructure of square and round tubing served as an almost architectural framework for the lavishly ornamented outer crown, using joining techniques for the tubing that are difficult to assess without close examination. The figural components of the outer crown, such as the females with four wings, the pomegranates, and the flowers, appear to have been attached between and to the tubing by a combination of tangs, wire rings, riveting, and perhaps soldering or gluing. Much more could be said about the making of this extraordinary piece. However, in the context of this paper, I will emphasize a single but prominent technical feature of the crown. The overriding design approach that called for hundreds of bits and pieces of gold and employed an astonishing number of different decorative techniques and methods of joining the many components together. In other words, and with the discussion of Puabi's jewelry in mind, I would say that the primary visual impact of the Nimrud crown is one of tremendous technical ostentation, not at all one of hidden skill and expertise. There seems to have been no premium placed on using fewer rather than multiple pieces of gold or on retaining the unity of the gold used or on maximizing the shine of the gold via large hammered but undecorated surfaces. <clears throat> The many individual and varied elements joined together by an assortment of means, including the baser and less pure metal of solder, did not allow for such unity or for the retaining of purity, nor for a seamlessness of design that hid the hand of the maker. There was no emphasis on restricted, repetitive, and seemingly prescribed formulae. Here, the talents of the mortal crafts person were being manifestly celebrated by highlighting a technical repertoire that one might best describe as everything but the kitchen sink, while the owner of the crown was vis being visibly elevated in life and in death by her ability to command such expertise and extravagance. The crown thus constituted royalty, royalty not only as signaled through the traditional symbolism of the crown itself, but also as overtly advertised through the very act or performance of its making. From tomb two, there are numerous examples of technically complex adornment. One spectacular piece is a diadem or headband of a type well known from depictions on contemporary ivory carvings, also from Nimrud. The diadem was fashioned of woven gold sections that via expertly fashioned gold hinges, connect an elaborately decorated central ornament of gold with five equally ornate gold medallions. The woven straps were as complicated to make as they appear, literally by interlinking loops of gold wire. The central ornament is comprised of two nearly square bezels, which are surrounded by two rows of granulation with inlaid stone, glass, or paste that has deteriorated. The rectangular shape of the double settings is framed by repoussé round studs accentuated by two concentric circles of granulation. The lower edge of the centerpiece was decorated with two rows and multiple triangles of very fine granulation. The five gold medallions were embellished with comparable patterns of studs and granulation and set with large fisheye agate stones. Finally, the central, ter central and terminal ornaments were further adorned with fringes of gold loop and loop chain, each strand of which culminates in a tiny pomegranate. As was the case with the crown from tomb three, the making of this di diadem entailed tremendous technical range and virtuosity, the results of which were very much visible in the end product. It is worth mentioning that there were additional and similarly designed diadem elements found in tomb two, these with multicolored stones or glass intricately inlaid to create exquisite renditions in miniature of motifs that were iconic to the imagery found on Ashur Paul II's palace reliefs. It thus seems that the message of kingship or royalty in general was being broadcast on every possible scale in every possible medium and format and by every technical means available. Tomb two also yielded several large, uh, several pair of large and dramatic bracelets that resemble the radiating wristwatch-like ornaments worn by the king and others on so many Assyrian palace reliefs. 
including some in our, some in our own galleries. The surfaces of these massive gold bracelets were virtually covered with superbly executed inlay work showing the most intricate of patterns and narrative scenes, many of which once again find close parallels on the monumental reliefs that decorated Assyrian palaces. A variety of different stones possibly, and possibly glass or paste were used as inlays. Large fisheye agate stones were prominently featured on one pair at the center of the face and all around the cuff of the bracelet. By the time these remarkable jewels were completed, very little of the gold surface remained undecorated. The level of technical showmanship on display in these pieces is simply astounding. I could say much more about the manufacture of the ornaments I have selected to show you today and about the many hundreds of others from both Ur and Nimrud that I have not mentioned. However, what I am most interested in, as stated all along, is the contrast between the overall procedural and associated conceptual approaches to the making of the Ur versus the Nimrud assemblages. What I have argued for the adornment of the royal women at Nimrud is closely related to, related to what Ellen Swift's reading to Ellen Swift's reading of Roman jewelry in which the deliberate technical ostentation and individual character of the jewelry both signaled and helped to construct an identity of power and prestige in the Roman world of elite and imperial obsessions and ambitions. Swift notes that, quote, elite status could be amplified or represented through the use of intricate decorative patterns and labor-intensive, highly skilled decorative techniques. Such designs impress through an awareness on the part of the viewer of the difficulty with which they are achieved, end quote. To my mind, the Nimrud jewelry likewise constitutes a flamboyant display of royal prerogative as activated in part by this type of making. Puabi's jewelry was instead marked by an outward simplicity of forms, the repetition of a limited range of designs and techniques all geared towards retaining the unity and purity of the gold and enhancing its inherent shine, and a seamlessness of manufacture that was prescriptive in its consistency, all of which technologically supported a deliberate attempt to produce or reproduce the semantics of purity, shine, and some element of the sacred in the finished jewels. And as demonstrated, the making of Puabi's jewelry entailed skill and labor intensity that easily rivaled what was required for the creation of the Nimrud jewels, with the exception that the technical difficulty was all but hidden at Ur. The ostentation of Puabi's adornment lay purely in the perceived preciousness of the material, hence the far easier focus for these many years on the economic and political significance of the burial and thus on the royal nature of the power and prestige deemed to be associated with it. Yet it is precisely the uniform, seamless, semantically loaded and hidden character of the techniques chosen for the making of Puabi's jewels that invite the possibility of active cultic production as if hiding or erasing the hand of the mortal craftsman was deemed able to impart a cultic charge to the jewelry and thus to the identity of its wearer as well. To finish, I would like to return to the observation by Zainab Bahrani, cited at the start of this talk, that in the Mesopotamian mindset, identity and presence could reside not only in the organic or biological body of a person, but also in inorganic objects that were in contact with that body. In other words, and here I again quote Bahrani, identity was a form of presence that could take on numerous manifestations, end quote. Considered in, this, considered in this light, jewelry as a category would count among the most logical of such manifestations since it is intimately connected to the body of the wearer. Jewelry can thus become an object with agency, analogous to the case of the king's garment in the Mesopotamian substitution ritual or of the gold overlay on statues of deities, literally conceptualized as skin, or of the actual jewelry that is so closely tied to the identity and powers of the goddess Inanna Ishtar. All of these are examples of inorganic extensions of biological bodies, whether mortal or divine, and therefore as efficacious as the original itself. What I have tried to add today is the technological aspect, how such agency and identity were material, materially manufactured and conceptually manipulated through the technology of jewelry in the burials at Ur and Nimrud 
both as effective extensions of the persons themselves and as part of the cultic and royal activation of their identities. There is perhaps no better confirmation of jewelry's potency and connection to identity in Mesopotamia, especially in burial, than that of the curse found in tomb two at Nimrud, naming Yaba, the royal consort or wife of the Neo-Assyrian King Tiglath Pileser III. And here I quote from Farouk al-Rawi's translation. Whoever in the future, be it queen who sits on the throne or a palace lady who is concubine of the king, removes me from my tomb or puts anybody else with me or lays his hand upon my jewelry with evil intent or breaks open the seal of that tomb, above earth, under the rays of the sun, let his spirit roam outside in thirst and may the great gods of the underworld afflict his corpse in ghost with eternal restlessness. Thank you.